everything that was being told to the Georgian society was basically, uh, you know, a manufactured narrative. It was, you know, any time now we were going to go into NATO, we we're going to become members of NATO. Any time now Europe was going to come and get us. Um, uh, and it got, and basically the social hysteria got to the point where uh, the 2008 war happened. Uh, and I'm not saying that it was a direct contribution to it as a sort of a, you know, as, 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 a, as a cause of what happened in 2008. I think it was a strategic, strategic blunder uh, that Georgia will pay, in, in, you know, in, in the long term future, um, uh, will continue to pay in the long term future. But um, that whole social energy, yes, played a certain role into normalizing such extremely risky and sort of suicidal national mission uh, to, you know, to invade South Ossetia, knowing um, that the Russian troops would react. Hello, everybody. This is Pascal from Neutrality Studies. And today I'm joined by Georgi Lasha Kasaratse. Lasha is originally from Georgia, and I mean the country in Eastern Europe, not the state in the US. He's an international relations analyst and expert on the former Soviet Union, covering mainly the South Caucasus and the Black Sea region. He works in the US as a liaison officer for the Sorkumi State University, which itself used to be part of Abkhazia, um, but since 1993, the Abkhazian war has been based in Tbilisi, the capital of Georgia. Uh, Lasha, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you very much for having me, Pascal. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, Lasha, let's start a little bit with your background because you're you, you're a very interesting personality because you're working for a Georgian university that used to be in Abkhazia. You uh, were born as a citizen of the Soviet Union, and then the the, the place where you were born became. Georgia. And then at the age of 15, you moved to the United States. And by now you are a dual dual national. Could you tell us a little bit about yourself and also about your university and what you're doing in the US now? Uh, sure. Uh, so very briefly, I came uh, to the US uh, as a foreign student, as a, um, a high school uh, student back in 1995. Uh, and um, decided to hang around and uh, have been here since. Uh, I got my graduate, uh, I got my BA from uh, a local uh, college here in Orlando. Orlando was the first uh, place where I came. Uh, and uh, then I moved on and got my master's uh, in Tufts University in the Fletcher School uh, and gradually worked my way into uh, the field uh, of international relations. Uh, uh, and security um, uh, studies and decided to sort of give it a more practical um, uh, direction uh, and uh, uh, sort of start to contribute my opinions, my views, my, my analysis uh, uh, in the field towards um, uh, transatlantic community and um, international relations uh, and uh, regional studies. And then I focused uh, mainly on uh, former Soviet republics uh, and then the uh, South Caucasus. Um, in terms of uh, my involvement with the uh, Sahomi State University (SSU), uh, we I've, I've known I've known them for quite some time, uh, and um, they you know they they reached out to me and um, mentioned uh, introduced me to um, uh, this concept of university diplomacy as a way to introduce Georgia and Georgia's uh, regional uh, politics. Uh, uh, regional, regional stance and its uh, relationship with the rest of the world, especially um, uh, to its Western partners. And I love the concept, the conceptual framework that the rector of the university, uh, Mr. Honelidze, presented to me uh, when I was in Georgia and I met him in his, uh, in his office in, in the university. Uh, and um, we decided to work on it. Um, I agreed to um, uh, introduce that concept um, uh, that uh, talks about university diplomacy as a as a practice, as a as a sort of a do tank kind of um, uh, practice, uh, um, and um, a strong component of that is the South Caucasus, Georgia, and the South Caucasus is a geopolitical entity, um, and um, this basically this concept involves uh, the formula of one pl plus one plus one, which is. Um, 
uh, South Caucasus, all three republics, Azerbaijan, Armenia, uh, Georgia, um, and um, uh, Russia, and the United States and Europe. Um, this is um, the concept that has been around for a while uh, and uh, has been alterating. Uh, there have been different, uh, different um, um, enumerations of the concept and different uh, structures of the concept that have been controversial in the past. So this is the one of the latest ones that um, uh, the director of the university is um, um, certain that is a much better sort of combination uh, in terms of regional uh, arrangement. Uh, and um, I decided to help them out. I you know, became personally interested in it. And then eventually we introduced the concept to my uh, uh, alma mater in, in, in the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, where I went to school uh, as an alumni now. Uh, and uh, they love the concept and we've been in touch with them since. Um, and so that's my involvement with the, uh, uh, with the university. Um, and in addition to that, I, I uh, sort of on, my, on a personal level, um, uh, create analytic podcasts with Stratford. I'm involved with them. Uh, and again, we discuss uh, uh, all things geopolitics, international relations, regional politics, South Caucasus, and obviously the current events. Um, so that's, uh, that's my involvement within, in the field. And you, I suppose that you still have strong ties back home to uh, Georgia, to Tbilisi. Do you also have any ties to Abkhazia, where your university was originally born? Uh, yes, I, I do have strong ties, close ties with Georgia. I go there once in, uh, well, before the pandemic, I would go there before uh, almost every year or so. Uh, and then I slowed it down. But, um, um, you know, it's funny you ask about Abkhazia. My mom is from Abkhazia. My, my family is from Abkhazia. Uh, but but uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, given given the reality on the ground, I have not been, my family has not been there. Uh, we do have relatives there um, yeah, that uh, come and visit us in Tbilisi, actually, um, quite often, which is, uh, which I personally, uh, you know, I, I like that fact that where there is still communication that can still uh, leave, you know, leave Sukhumi and come and you know, sort of travel back and forth. Um, but um, unfortunately, the situation there is dire, economically speaking, uh, on, you know, both peoples are suffering uh, in terms of uh, economic underdevelopment and unemployment and all that. Uh, but um, no, I, to answer your question, I have not been since I was very, very young. Yeah. And what's what's the situation at the moment? Is it possible for 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 anyone in, in Tbilisi to go to Sokhumi? Sokhumi is the, the, the capital of Abkhazia and yeah. vice versa. I mean, is it possible to exchange or is there a really hard, hard border? Is it is it like... No, there is... Uh, well, uh, there is a... a Hard border, obviously, but uh, there is a, a exchange between Georgians and, and Abkhazians. Abkhazians uh, uh, come and uh, utilize uh, Georgia's, um, uh, uh, for example, healthcare system, uh, uh, which is a um, sort of so soft power, soft you know dip uh, d diplomacy that the that the uh, uh, consequent Georgian governments have, have have tried to maintain with with Abkhazia and the society and, and, and Abkhaz society there, um, uh, and I, I do agree with that. I think uh, it's a much needed um, uh, sort of um, uh, way of you know you know working on soft power diplomacy and maintenance of relationship between the two peoples because it is unfortunate what happened. Uh, Georgians and Abkhazians have historically always been together. Um, it, but, you know, it, it's not a free movement of peoples, uh, obviously. Um, <clears throat> there are still risks involved. Um, but, uh, yes, people people do uh, uh, travel uh, because the, the, the connection between Abkhazians and, and Georgians uh, um, has always been very close. So relatives, family members are on both sides of the border, basically. And... Uh, just like in my case, in my family's case, um, they do, you know, they travel and, and they, they visit each other. Um, uh, but this is all basically under the radar. This is all civil relations, um, relations among civilians uh, um, that helps, obviously, um, to maintain, um, you know, some contact between the peoples. But um, 
clearly uh, sort of a free free travel, free exchange of peoples uh, is is basically restricted and unadvised, unadvised, so to speak. But yeah, and you know, it's 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 so um, it's so tragic because we have this all over Eurasia, right? Everywhere you go on this continent, you have peoples that live right next to each other and that historically belong to each other and, and, and trade and work yeah. and live and love, etc. And then these these ties, they can break down for any of several reasons, right? And all these places all over Eurasia have that dynamic. I mean, Switzerland could break apart tomorrow into at least three yeah. language parts, right? It could happen. It's not, I mean, the dynamic, the political dynamic is luckily one that's not, but it could happen just as easily. Now, in Georgia, it has happened. In Ukraine, it's happening as we speak. And here I would like to go into the main topic because you wrote an email to me pointing out that the South Caucasus, where Georgia is located, had not received its fair share of attention especially Georgia, uh, which offers an analytical reservoir to be used to better explain the current shifts in global affairs. Those are your words. And um, what has taken place in Tbilisi, you argued, uh, in the past 30 years after its independence, has much to do with the present standoff between Moscow and Washington. The short Ru Russo-Georgian War of 2008, which most of us or all of us remember, was a clear sign of the change to come, right? So with Georgia's defeat, you told me in an email, uh, Russia ended Washington's unfettered interference in Russia's strategic underbelly. And there's no doubt that fundamentally similar reasons are driving Moscow's action in Ukraine at the moment. Could you explain what you meant with that and what your, what your main issue is that you would like to kind of get out to everybody? Uh, first, I, I just now remembered how much I actually packed into that email. So, you did. Uh, <laughs> I, I know, but, uh, you know, apologize if that complicated things. Uh, um, so, what I mean by that, uh, Pascal, is that um, I'll just give you a uh, go back a little. Uh, so, since 1991, Georgia you know, got its independence. Uh, uh, it experienced civil wars, uh, you know, ethnic wars. Uh, South Ossetia is another separatist region uh, supported by Russia. Um, and um, Georgia was basically became a, a failed state uh, in the early 90s. Um, then with the uh, with the with coming of Shevardnadze, former uh, foreign minister of the Soviet Union, uh, Eduard Shevardnadze, uh, things started to gradually improve, um, uh, largely due to his reputation as a as an international, uh, you know, a major figure in in bringing down the the, the wall, so to speak, uh, along with uh, with Mikhail Gorbachev, uh, and the West, uh, and especially uh, you know uh, uh, the American friends of Georgia, and then uh, you know uh, back then mostly of Gorbachev and Shevardnadze, um, never forgot that. And they really um, elevated Shevardnadze and, it's, uh, you know, and, and Gorbachev, as you, as you know, as um, sort of um, freedom fighters uh, against that evil empire. And Shevardnadze's reputation remained intact, um, very much so. His uh, close friend, uh, James Baker, uh, you might recall, um, had a really good relationship with him. So Shevardnadze came with a, a huge global sort of reputation on the world stage. And that helped Georgia uh, to uh, really get on the radar of Western nations, particularly uh, of, of Washington. Um, and then gradually things started to improve uh, in terms of Georgia's visibility uh, uh, and, and its um, and the expression of its sort of uh, national uh, um, strategy and ambition to join the West um, uh, someday in the future. Um, uh, Western security and economic infrastructure, the European Union and NATO, of course, became um, a sort of central uh, strategic uh, uh, goal of Georgia. Uh, and it remains, it remains so uh, to this day. Um, but then uh, Shevardnadze's uh, government, uh, due to extreme corruption, uh, and backwardness, uh, and then uh, due to uh, blatant sort of uh, uh, manufacturing of votes during his election, uh, really what became a last straw, uh, the last straw for the society, and they decided to uh, uh, replace him. Uh, and then you what, recall... The what year was that? 2003. 2003. 
Uh, and so we, we got the Rose Revolution um, that brought the United National Movement uh, and Saakashvili and his, and his party uh, to power. And, um, you know, to be fair, uh, and we have to be objective here, uh, in, the, in the beginning of the, in the, in the first years of Saakashvili's governance, uh, a lot of good things happened. Uh, you know, reforms took place. Uh, uh, he received... Uh, um, you know, enormous accolades in, in Washington, in Brussels. Uh, he became, uh, you know, this sort of this young, energetic reformer um, in the former Soviet space, uh, especially in the South Caucasus, where this had basically, um, uh, this was a basically unheard of. Uh, and he did, did implement some serious necessary reforms uh, in the first few years of his administration. Um, and then uh, things went south, started to go south in terms of his uh, usurpation of power uh, and, and concentration of power in his hands. And he became you know, basically a soft autocrat, um, supported nevertheless by the Bush administration very strongly uh, and the whole establishment of the Washington's foreign policy elite and establishment. Um, uh, call it, I don't know, the concert of neocons and, and, and neoliberals uh, or liberal internationalists, you know, the traditional sort of the usual suspects. Um, and, uh, you know, he really lost himself. He really ruined the reputation of his own administration and of his own uh, party. Um, uh, they were allegations of egregious violations of human rights, uh, corruption, um, confiscation of private property became sort of a daily routine. Uh, so basically, um, the, the story goes that his um, a love for Reagan and free markets, by the way, and Ayn Rand and Margaret Thatcher, and, you know, this, this whole philosophy that he very aggressively tried to uh, uh, import into Georgia, um, uh, became basically neo-Bolshevism. I mean, uh, you know, any successful business was chased down. Uh, people were being threatened. Uh, jails became overcrowded with, with uh, uh, you know, with um, uh, uh, folks that, as many say, and has become uh, known now, um, got away for... Uh, on minor charges with 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 long prison sentences, uh, some of them were even falsely accused, um, and that whole that infamous uh, number of zero point zero one percent acquittal rating became sort of a daily um, uh, entered the daily sort of a vocabulary of George of the Georgian society, uh, often compared to Lukashenko's uh, in Belarus to Lukashenko's um, uh, numbers, uh, meaning. Uh, that Lukashenko had better record in acquitting his prison, political prisoners than 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 Saakashvili, who was being presented as this golden boy, you know, liberal democrat uh, to to the rest of his people, um, and uh, and the situation became uh, so bad, uh, you know, towards the end of his administration that in 2012. So between 2003 and 2012, that's so nine years of his of the United National Movement's rule, uh, came to an end. Um, and uh, now we have uh, the Georgian Dream government uh, that came to power, um, uh, basically uh, with the leadership of Ivanishvili, uh, who is uh, a billionaire uh, who made his money in Russia, uh, late 80s, early 90s. Uh, uh, and uh, he is, you know, obviously being called an oligarch and the West doesn't trust him. And um, he's not, you know, if 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 Saakash really was a son of a bitch, he was he was, uh, you know, America's son of a bitch. Right. That whole whole um, uh, expression uh, that that, you know, we have here in the States. Uh, but uh, this but Ivan Shvili is not a um, uh, he's you know, he just has not garnered that trust and earned that respect, um, you know, mainly because he's perceived as being a, a um, 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 basically Moscow stooge. Um, now, be that as it may, you know, you, 
you can oh go ahead sorry i need i need to ask a question so first first of all the whole uh, our son of a bitch was coined in the us in in reference to pinochet right which who was right, a right, right. Think, yes. uh, installed by the united states and doing the us bidding uh, but being a fascist dictator really right um uh, and another question one question though so in russia and also in ukraine um, we know that the big sellout of the state happened in the 1990s, right? I mean, Gorbachev basically uh, liberalized the economy, meaning that a few people got filthily rich um, by buying up the state assets at discount prices. That's how the a lot of the modern oligarchs came along. Um, you are saying that a lot of the sellout of, of uh, Georgia happened between 2003 and 2012, um, or was a bar big part of that already happening in uh, in the 1990s? Well, that whole um, the whole market reform and shock therapy, uh, you know, those Harvard boys, you know, the, the, the Chicago boys, the economists that went there, uh, that, yeah, that was happening way before it was happening shortly after the breakup of the soviet union so early 90s uh which caused enormous uh, inequalities uh and concentration of you know great wealth in the hands of very few um and then basically russia was a mafia state uh you know uh under yeltsin um and um which uh, you know as we all know now contributed to putin's coming to power uh and you know uh, and then Putin's politics since that time on till today. Um, but, uh, you know, in Georgia, uh, Georgia did not experience uh, that, that capitalist rush uh, as, uh, as, as much as Russia did. Um, uh, and, you know, we could go in there, go, go into that perhaps on the next show, or if you want me to, I can mention with a couple of words, but in a couple of sentences here on, on, on what happened, but mostly Georgia was isolated during during that process and wasn't being paid much attention uh, during the chaotic 90s. Um, thanks to Shevardnadze, Georgia, uh, yes, it, it, it got on the radar of, of, of Western powers, uh, but um, uh, in terms of uh, in terms of sort of uh, creating a market economy out of uh, the newly, you know, newly uh, printed uh, Republic of Georgia, uh, that was not a priority uh, uh, for for Washington. Uh, I think um, uh, you know, ninety five percent of the effort was being made to make sure that uh, Yeltsin uh, stood up straight and and. Uh, and and to make sure that uh, Russia's uh, nuclear weapons uh, weapon stockpile uh, uh, was under uh, a state control uh, was a huge uh, concern, obviously, um, in, in in Washington. Um, but what happened in just to go back to Georgia for a second? Um, Georgia's uh, experiment was uh, the sort of unipolar moment experiment, where where you know the breakup of the Soviet Union left the United States as a sole Whole, uh and and really what what was what was started to happen was America basically was searching for its own jesters uh for for the court of liberal internationalism and they found Georgia um and they found Ukraine uh a little later on uh but Georgia I would I would argue was a was probably you know the, the first experiment so to speak in the region the South Caucasus uh that received the um uh, sort of overwhelming attention uh, when it comes to um, uh, export of democracy, democracy promotion, you recall the freedom agenda of the Bush administration uh, that um, uh, really uh, uh, built up the reputation of Saakashvili in turn as his, you know, golden boy, uh, that he could do no, no wrong. Um, which to, I would say, a large extent contributed to his unfettered uh, you know, limitless power in the country. Um, uh, and so that was, uh, you know, and, and and so what happened was it was really in, in, in philosophic terms. I mean, if, 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 if you heard of the philosopher uh, Baudelaire, when he denied the uh, first Gulf War that ever took place, it was that type of uh, um, societal environment in which everything was based on this extreme hyper reality everything that was being told to the Georgian society was basically, uh, you know, a manufactured narrative. It was, you know, any time now we were going to go into NATO, we we're going to become members of NATO. Any time now Europe was going to come and get us. Um, 
Uh, and it got and basically the social hysteria got to the point where uh, the 2008 war happened. Uh, and I'm not saying that it was a direct contribution to it as a sort of, a, you know, as, 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 as a cause of what happened in 2008. I think it was a strategic, strategic blunder uh, that Georgia will pay, in, in, you know, in, in the long term future, um, uh, will continue to pay in the long term future. But um, that whole social energy, yes, played a certain role into normalizing such extremely risky and sort of suicidal national mission uh, to, you know, to invade South Ossetia, knowing um, that the Russian troops would react. And then the question became, of course, that if he didn't know, then, you know, in other words, you know, from bad to worse, Georgia got in terms of strategic decision making. If you knew the risks, why did you do it? And then if you didn't know the risks, then what were you doing, uh, <laughs> you know, as president? Um, how did you not gather enough intelligence to know that Russia would, would react? Uh, so that was really becoming, so the whole situation uh, sort of showed that there was very little to no excuse, um, uh, you know, to to do what, what, you know, to do what he did and and what happened in 2008. Because uh, just just the final point here, Georgia went strategically speaking from bad to worse. I mean, we'll, you know, Shevardnadze sort of managed to 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 keep uh, you know South in South Ossetia and, and Abkhazia unrecognized that whole non recognition policy of Moscow of these two regions. Uh, you know, whether you like Shevardnadze or you know dislike him, he did maintain that through his balancing act. Um, uh, but um, after the war, uh, Georgia went from bad to worse strategically and in terms of territorial integrity and sovereignty because Russia shortly after the invasion recognized uh, uh, Abkhazia and South Ossetia as independent states within Georgia, you see. Uh, so now, yeah, so it's even, now we are even further from, from, uh, from, the, from any possibility of returning these territories, basically. Yeah, so... Um... You know, this is very, very interesting, and it is one of the things I also don't know about. So can you maybe explain, um, or can we talk about the following? Why is Abkhazia and South Ossetia, these are two small provinces. Uh, why are they so important to Russia? Um, se firstly, secondly, why are they... Why were they part of the Georgian SSR during the, so the, so the Soviet times and then became part of, jo of Georgia? And, and it's really interesting that you're saying that there was a social hysteria that led to this move to in 2008, right, of uh, Saakashvili just trying if he can invade these, these places and, you know, solve the problem for good. So I have I've read a lot of analysis that says that uh, it came after the NATO promise, right? 2008, Bucharest summit, NATO promised uh, that Georgia and, and Ukraine will be part of NATO. And Saakashvili kind of tested the resolve of the West or thinking that, OK, if he does it now, NATO will come to his help and, and resolve the issue. And that, of course, didn't happen. And after that, you know, it, it gets worse and worse because... Um, the Western narrative then became that Russia fired the first shots, they attacked, they did what we always said they would do, and that's an absolute lie. A Swiss citizen, Heidi Tagliavini, wrote a report in which she detailed that no, the first shots were actually fired by um, Saakashvili's forces, and then the Russians kind of um, capitalized on the, on, on the, on the um, situation that presented itself. But in the West, this narrative is now so strong that last year, uh, Olaf Scholz, in his Zeitenwende, stupid piece, could write that Russia proved that they were evil because they, they invaded uh, um, Georgia uh, unprovoked. So this this narrative unprovoked and this social media, word, yes. it just yeah. it just keeps it just keeps spiraling and snowballing into into go getting worse and worse. Um, can we talk about this one? But maybe first, can you explain Abkhazia and South Ossetia? Abkhazia and South Ossetia have been part of Georgia ever since the creation of Georgia, historically speaking, uh, without going back to the early history, uh, both in terms of uh, the, the peoples, uh, the territories Language. of these two regions. Uh, uh, so close relations culturally, socially, uh, politically, and they were part of Georgia in terms of Georgia's uh, sovereignty as a, as, a, as, a, as a nation state. What, what uh, makes them different? 
this was also a problem uh, under the Soviet rule because the Soviets, if you recall, uh, and this was Stalin's sort of divided 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 and rule type. Well, Soviet, you know, the Russian Empire and the Soviets yeah, also. But Stalin is a Georgian, the, right? Stalin, Stalin, Stalin was a Georgian. Correct, correct, correct. And so that's that's a whole another conversation uh, to be had. But um, uh, you know, in terms of the Russian Empire and then the Soviets, uh, uh, this was a this was politics of sort of planting uh, geopolitical minefields within these republics, right? So you have um, you know you have Moldova, you have Azerbaijan, uh, Nagorno Karabakh, Armenia, you have Georgia. Uh, for strategic reasons, uh, so that in case the Soviet Union or uh, broke up, um, these countries would be uh, would also break up because the these nationalities within within Soviet states uh, would call for uh, you know you know strong national identities and separation from from uh, uh, you know, mainlands. Um, and so this was this was one of the uh, strategic sort of um, uh, strategic politics, if you will, of keeping the union intact, or at the very least, making it extremely difficult uh, for these countries to find themselves uh, independent from the Soviet Union um, and their sovereignty is fully intact. Uh, because if their sovereignty is, um, uh, you know, uh, you know. If, if, if they were going to be divided and if this politics succeeded, if this geopolitical view and, and methodology succeeded, then divided nations would have a hard time joining other alliances, uh, mainly Western alliances. Uh, and so basically, we, by doing this, um, Russia basically, uh, you know, increased its chances uh, dramatically uh, for uh, preventing any major Western security, uh, you know, uh, alliance coming into its soft underbelly, uh, underbelly or its near abroad, as it calls it, uh, because as we all know, divided nations and divided, you know, you know, sovereign territories are are very hard sell uh, <laughs> uh, to become independent, uh, totally independent states uh, within, say, European Union or or uh, or NATO. Uh, and so that was basically the strategic, the core strategic purpose uh, uh, of of uh, creating this this borderlines uh, uh, within uh, within main mainland republics. So um, you're saying this is this is a this is a this was a strategy by Stalin himself, who was a Georgian national, uh, who was, was Georgian a Georgian national that Correct. that you you stoke like internal. Uh, division in order for more more easy central Moscow well, it, uh, 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 control and make that is correct because the the whole purpose was to maintain the Soviet Union and all these different republics because let's remember these republics are made up of different eth ethnic uh, 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 ethnic ethnic cultures uh, and nationalities um, so you know we're not Slavs Georgians are not Slavs Armenians are not Slavs uh, so. Abkhazians are not. You know, it's, a, it's a very different cultures. Um, but the Soviet Union and the Bolshevik philosophy was that these different peoples would be on equal basis, um, uh, uh, living, uh, you know, you know, hand in hand with each other um, uh, peacefully. Uh, Basically, even like, the, like, the, were, like, like the European Union, right? It's right, basic, like the European Union. Right, uh, right, hmm. right, right. But. Bolsheviks, to a certain extent, there are a lot of scholars, for example, um, uh, um, he's an Ameri Armenian American scholar, Sunni, uh, the last name. Uh, he's a, um, an expert on the Caucasus. Uh, and uh, he, you know, he gives credit to Bolsheviks to a certain extent uh, uh, for creating equality uh, amongst peoples. There was no racial division. Uh, in the Soviet Union, everybody sort of traveled and 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 uh, said hi to each other based on uh, this whole idea of Soviet citizenship. Um, uh, there were there were pretty close cultural and political uh, uh, ties uh, amongst different peoples uh, of the Soviet Union. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, these these geopolitical minefields were set up uh, so that um, uh, separation of these states. Um, Within their fully sovereign, uh, uh, with their fully sovereign status, would not happen. Um, so now we're dealing with the outcome of that, right? So, so Georgia, for example, when when the Soviet Union broke up, Russia, you know, did everything in its power to 
um, uh, to um, uh, cause uh, you know the separatist movements in 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 Georgia, um, uh, and um, you know South Ossetia and Abkhazia, thanks to Russia, separated from 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 Georgia. They they created the separatist movements that caused you know milit- you know uh, warfare and political and economic turmoil and. Um, and, and then basically even civil war within Georgia. Um, uh, and um, basically the Kremlin had enormous power, uh, uh, even at, in, in the post-Soviet Kremlin, I'm talking about after the Soviet Union broke up, and which is something, by the way, that uh, Western analysts uh, uh, kind of um, uh, underestimate because when they say that uh, Russia is this big uh, gas station or, you know, the standard phrases that they that they use to describe sort of the backwardness of Russia. Let's let's remember that even when Russia was down and out in the early 90s, uh, it still managed to engage in brutal wars against Chechnya and re-incorporate, re-subjugated Chechnya into its, you know, into its uh, influence. Um, same thing in, in Georgia, it did. Um, uh, so the idea that Russia, you know, doesn't have much wherewithal or doesn't care, you know, doesn't have enough power, military power to uh, uh, to control Georgia, Ukraine, you know, Chechnya, Azerbaijani, you know, uh, relationship between Azerbaijan and Armenia. I think it's a foolish argument. Uh, Russia will always have enough ammunition to uh, cause, you know, you know, enough havoc in, in the region to make sure uh, that, um, uh, you know, no NATO or, you know, to a lesser degree, the European Union uh, comes into its, you know, uh, near abroad. Um, so, uh, but uh, in terms of uh, comparison, you know, comparing the whole situation to what's happening with Ukraine, um, the parallels are very similar. Uh, you know, you know, uh, this whole narrative of Georgia, Ukraine joining NATO into the Bucharest summit was the last straw for Putin, as you, as you, as you pointed out earlier. Um, and uh, that obviously uh, was a uh, big mistake uh, in Western capitals. Uh, remember, you know, uh, uh, Sarkozy and, and uh, Angela Merkel refused uh, Georgia's membership, um, and Bush couldn't really do anything about it. Um, and um, I remember also that um, uh, that. Um, the decision to one day make Georgia and Ukraine members of NATO left both of these countries between the rock and a hard place. It was one of the worst decisions, strategically speaking. So basically, they gave you some abstract metaphysical commitment that will, you know, basically never say never, but chances are that it will never happen. Uh, pissed off Russia in the process because they still did not say no. They said that sometime in the future, maybe, yes. <laughs> uh, and then they emboldened Georgians to believing that they were going to become members of NATO. And then this entire politics followed afterwards of this radicalization of society that anybody who even questioned the possibility of uh, Georgia becoming a member of NATO was either considered pro-Russian or fired from work or persecuted in, in one way or the other. And even now, this, this sort of ideologically driven uh, mentality uh, dominates in Georgia, unfortunately. Um, uh, and um, this, this, this talk of opening up Georgia as the second front against Russia to aid Ukraine, uh, I mean, I don't have hard evidence to believe it. Uh, I mean, not, you know, I, I believe it personally, but that means very little. But I wouldn't be surprised if behind the scenes a suggestion like that uh, came from, you know, from the U.S. or from uh, uh, from Brussels, from the European Union folks. Um, you know, I wouldn't be surprised. But I, you know, to say that I have hard evidence of that. But imagine the foolishness of that. I mean, it's so it's almost like never ending. It's basically a, a suicidal mission. I mean, no, uh, you know, to you know, if they had implemented it, I would argue that there would be no one in Western capitals who would stop it. That's that's what's scary about it. If, if yeah. for example, the radicals took over and won. Um, as the war had started in Ukraine, as, as Russia invaded Ukraine, 
there is no saying that anybody would stop them from opening up the second front, you see. No, and look, it's very, very easy. We know now for sure, 100%, that the United States and the Europeans are utterly happy and content with sending a half a million Ukrainians to their graves. If just there's a chance of weakening Russia through that, they would do exactly the same to Georgians. And they, the worst thing is they would code it, sugar code it into, oh, no, we want to help them. We want to make them happy. Yes. But they have That's to start. I, 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 you know, I, it makes me it makes me vomit. It's like and these are, they are willing to do that. They are willing to send them to the graves. Blinken was just like going and visiting the graves in Ukraine of all of these people who wouldn't need to die, who wouldn't have needed to die if there just had been negotiations. That's all in December 2021. And and same for Georgia. And make no mistake, the whole NATO they would they would they would uh, they would sacrifice Georgia with a smile on their faces uh, and and righteousness in their hearts, self righteousness. Um, sorry, but um, I, I'm I'm drifting off. One thing I, I want to uh, no, I sympathize with you. I, I I mean Georgia came has come, you know, on the edge of precipice all throughout its history many many times. Yeah. And to say that, and the irony of it, the dark cynicism of it is that. If, imagine if it happened, this existential threat that Georgia has yeah. always faced from Russia actually materialized in the 21st century. Yeah, not, not, not when, in the 20th. When Georgia, when Georgia actually adheres to Western principles and, and, and becoming a member yeah. of the West. So yeah. How ironic would that be, right? And so, uh, the, and, and, but the thing is, uh, you know, the problem is sort of Georgians have not gotten to this hermeneutical circle. Their, their, their interpretation kind of is awful when it comes to these things. They're very vulnerable. There's so much mm -hmm. cultural strategy of Georgia is such that uh, it's always been West, 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 ignoring uh, in the past 30 years, I would say, I would underline that because, you know, in the early history of Georgia, Georgia balanced uh, and had and, and, and understood sort of the sort of pragmatic foreign policy. Uh, just for the sake of survival. Uh, uh, but in the past 30 years, uh, it's become uh, just uh, idea, you know, a, an ideology and sort of sectarian ideology um, rather than a, a foreign policy calculation, careful calculation as to how to survive in this extremely hostile environment. And when you know that Russia would not mind coming in, and if it happened for the second time, Russia, I have no doubt in my mind, Putin will take Belize. Yeah. And he will basically end Georgia. This is not to be sensationalist or anything like that, but this is this is the stuff of geopolitics and real politics. This is, you know, there is no chance that Moscow will allow NATO in the, in the middle of the Caucasus. It's just it's not going to happen. Um, there, there's a very, very interesting point here, which is that, OK, we have learned now that we need to utterly discard what we hear and we need to analyze what we see. And Georgia is OK. Georgia had this war in 2008, but it was very brief. And then somehow Georgia stepped away from the brink. Again, this 2012 election and that brought in a government that in the West, everybody's, oh, they're pro-Russian. But they're actually not. They're they're pro like being alive and being Georgia and, right. and, 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 and keeping what you can. Right. They're being very realist. And so Georgia stepped away from that brink that then Ukraine stepped into. And, um, you know, 2017, the election that brought in uh, uh, um, Zelensky was supposed to Zelensky was supposed to be a peace uh, president, right? And 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 create reconciliation. Well, I don't think Zelensky Russians. was. I don't think Zelensky was set on antagonizing Russia in the beginning. Yeah. Few, yeah. In the beginning year or a few months, uh, and. Uh, you know, things started to change later on. Yeah. Uh, so, so yeah. Ukraine stepped into that space that Georgia kind of stepped away from. And how is it that then Georgia now manages not to be not to be pushed? I mean, Georgia even uh, the the current government refused to send lethal aid to the to Ukraine, right? Uh, so, no, it doesn't go along even with the sanctions of the West. So, it's actually kind of trying to be neutral between these fronts at the moment, which is very very important for Georgia. How is it that that's possible? That's a very good question, and basically, uh, sort of the point of our conversation here, because the reason that I attribute it to uh, um, uh, to this decision um, and to sort of allowing sort of Georgia succeeding to get away from it is that um, is what was happening under Saakashvili. 
uh, and what happened in 2008 uh, and what happened under this unfettered blind, you know, freedom agenda promotion under the Bush administration. Um, and when Ukraine war happened and when, when, when Russia invaded Ukraine, uh, that really showed to Georgians that uh, they would they could very well be, be on the next in line. Yeah. That the 2008 wasn't going to be um, the last war with Russia. Uh, that Russia would be more than willing to come in and and uh, and take Belisi so the second time around. Um, and so there's two events, basically domestic politics in Georgia. Mm -hmm. People became just tired of what was happening under Saakashvili. Um, and this, um, again, as I mentioned, as I alluded to earlier, this, this really madness of promoting democracy and NATO narratives that basically were fundamentally false narratives. And then Russia's invasion of Ukraine, um, uh, you know, really made the society think twice about pursuing that same. And then obviously the government uh, uh, picked up on it uh, during the elections. Uh, they were going to, they were blatantly stating that the Georgian dream government was not going to antagonize Russia. They were not going to continue on the same um, instigated foreign policy against Moscow that uh, the previous administration had done, had conducted. Um, and so basically, oh, and obviously the, the overall global change, uh, sort of this rise of um, uh, the multipolar world, um, uh, yeah, you know, uh, really made them think twice uh, about what, you know, about, uh, you know, about continuing that same, uh, you know, a foolish, foolish foreign policy towards Russia. Um, so those, those, I'll, I'll, I'll attribute that decision to, to the, to the, uh, uh, events that uh, I just listed. Yeah. It's very, very interesting. I have this private kind of hypothesis that one of the problems of Europe is that they're not afraid. Nobody's afraid anymore. Could you, would you, are, would you agree with me in saying that Georgians then became afraid? They are actually, they were scared that this could happen and therefore that brought to power this kind of, this kind of more realist uh, government that says, okay, yes. we are, we're hedging our bets now. Is that a fair analysis? Yes. They no, uh, absolutely. I mean, you know, people people are people. Basically, I don't want to be too you know the general here. And uh, but uh, no, uh, society in two thousand and eight, Georgia society saw that NATO was far away, uh, that Russia was more than willing to end the Georgian statehood. I think that was that became understood on a societal level, and obviously on the political sort of government level. Um, and uh, frankly, uh, you know, people were just getting tired of this adrenaline governance, uh, of this constant, uh, you know, sensationalism and propaganda uh, that Russia bad, we're great uh, uh, type of, um, uh, you know, and then and then, and then domestically uh, instigating and pinning you know, uh, society against each other and polarization that took place under Saakash, really. I mean, it was just, and even though now it's taking place at the same time, uh, the United National Movement and the radical wing, um, really, politically speaking, I would argue, has very little legitimacy. Uh, you know, the extremist few are probably still adhering to their to their views, but um, Basically, people, and this is not to say that the current government uh, has done great things. Uh, they've done some good things, but one of the, but overall, um, they could have done much more. And people are not satisfied with them. But one thing that there's a consensus on uh, is that they found that golden middle where, you know, in foreign policy, on the foreign policy front, where, you know, they managed to return to relations with Russia. Uh, and it is being done for the safety and security of the republic itself. So yeah. this pragmatic politics, sort of the rediscovery of this pragmatic politics, um, really in the past 15 years or so, um, is, is quite new uh, in Georgia. This yeah. is how radicalized politics were before this. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, this tells you that the Georgian society itself is more than willing to accept normalcy. Uh, and mind you, very importantly, they never lost, sort of Georgian political culture never lost faith in becoming members of the West someday in the, in the future. This is very strong that every, every uh, sort of social analysis uh, uh, speaks of this, uh, the percentage numbers of uh, 
desire to join NATO and the European Union are, remain to be very high into 70s. Um, uh, so this shows that, yes, it is possible not to try to brainwash the population and yet, you know, allow them to freely still want to become part of the West without antagonizing Moscow and without jeopardizing your country's, yeah. you know, your state, statehood and existence, really. But it, it also shows another thing, and this is really crucial because part and parcel of the Western narrative, the part of the thing that's so toxic is that they sold the idea that Russia is dead set on recreating the Soviet Union, ending Ukraine, oh, wow. you know, uh, absorb all the former Soviet republics. And this is just a stupid idea. This is just not what's happening. It's just utterly dumb. And you're telling me that Georgians understood that uh trying to antagonize russia to the point where it attacks you is unwise but that they are also at, at, at least at the moment not scared that uh absorbing georgia is a state priority of russia i mean the georgians are not thinking that oh if we don't join nato we will be absorbed it's it's the opposite right. it's like okay if we don't try to join and if we have good relations with russia we can be we can be a sovereign state in a good in a, in a good in a good situation in the Caucasus, right? In a good Just standing like with Russia, correct. Russia will not return Abkhazia and South Ossetia, but there will be enough flexibility there. There's a possibility for diplomacy, but you know, again, the irony here is that, that nobody can teach Georgians how to deal with Russians if they're just left alone to their devices. Meaning, right? I mean, yes, Georgians, in terms of understanding what Russia has done to Georgia throughout history. Uh, I hate to say it, but there is not an expert in the West that's going to really teach Georgians how to act against, you know, because you hear today, you know, if you don't say this, Russia will reincorporate you, and Georgia just laugh it off. They just laugh it off. They're like, you know, they, they, they ask, really, are you going to give me a recipe on how to deal with Russia when we know them for so long, both on culturally, socially, politically, geostrategically? Uh, you know, but, but Lasha, the, the, the polls will tell you exactly the same, but in the opposite, the polls will tell you we are the only ones to tell you how to deal with the Russians, right? You mean you mean the Georgian polls or no, the polls, the Polish, the, like I've, I've heard this, this before, argument. of course, yes, the polls of will tell you, you have to fight the yeah. Russians, correct, correct, correct. So, correct. and <laughs> the fundamental problem with it is fine if you want to deal with Russia. How is how is this a, a logical sense that when you are trying to push this impoverished small state into the jaws of a beast, and if you, uh, just to become a little rhetorical here, you go fight with Russia then, if that's what you, <laughs> you know, if that's what you want. Where is the logic here of pushing tiny states, you know, on the ver to, to, to the verge of destruction? When the logic, perfectly well, Russia, Russia has will have no qualms of coming back into Georgia and recapturing the country. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, just, just one detail I wanted to notice here. Um, I don't know if you've been following uh, politics of uh, between um, Azerbaijan and Armenia, mm -hmm. uh, especially in the last week or so. Um, mm -hmm. I think, uh, I highly doubt this, but I think, I hope that Pashinyan is not going to step into um uh, Saakashvili's uh, trap. Uh, he's apparently pissed off that uh, Russia didn't, re didn't back uh, Armenia in this latest in, in, in the 2020 war uh, against Azerbaijan. Uh, and uh, he's reaching out to, you know, to, to Western counterparts, uh, uh, to, to the French, to the Germans, to the, to the Americans. Uh, he has phone conversations with them. Uh, and so the literature, the past you know, a couple of weeks or so has been shaped uh, with this whole uh, um, with the with this whole proposition that uh, Pakistan is so pissed off that he might be looking at alternatives uh, uh, to you know to Russia uh, in the West. Um, now, this is very far fetched, uh, even though it's been written about. But and I, I don't I don't think Armenians are uh, foolish enough, uh, you know, uh, you know, to 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 make that choice. Uh, because they will repeat the same exact thing that Saakashvili did, which was to antagonize Russia to the point where he thought that he was going to bring in NATO into the South Caucasus. Uh, and if Pashinyan thinks that he's going to get close enough to Western uh, to Western politicians and, and capitals, uh, 
in hopes of balancing Russia or antagonizing Russia. If you take, I mean, he understands that this is just a game uh, to to show Russia, quote unquote, that there are options. And but behind the scenes, everybody understands where the red lines are. Uh, but um, uh, you know, just to just to bring this up as a comparison, uh, you know, you know, he should know better than you know if he if he ele- escalates this, uh, he will get on that on the tracks of Saakashvili's failures when it comes to failing to balance between the West and the East. Uh, uh, and so, but uh, it's been a very interesting development um, and commentary has been a lot, uh, a lot of commentary has been made about Pashinyan's actions. Uh, uh, and so, but Russia, and then, and, 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 and finally, uh, it's been used uh, to argue that Russia is so weakened by the war in Ukraine uh, that it might uh, not pay attention to to Armenia uh, for some time to come. Uh, anybody who believes that foolishness <laughs> is basically uh, guaranteeing uh, national suicide because uh, Russia will pay attention, <laughs> even even though it is entangled in uh, in Ukraine. Um, well, uh, Lasha, we 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 are getting we are getting closer to the one hour mark, and I would just like to maybe end on a positive note. Um, if you now look at Georgia and how Georgia stepped away from the brink and manages to live with two, you know, two breakaway regions and in a in a very, you know, uneasy but manageable relationship with Russia. Um, if you take that lesson and you applied it to Ukraine, do you see any way that that we might find a, a solution for Ukraine that that is inspired by Georgia? Could you recommend anything or see any any possibility? I, one of the reasons I wanted to reach out to folks like you is because of this. Uh, but I, I look at this as uh, from a very pessimistic point of view. Uh, mm. Ukraine is too late for Ukraine. Mm. Uh, it wasn't too late for Ukraine shortly after Zelensky became president. It wasn't too late for Ukraine even after 2014. Um, this could have been avoided. But at this point, it's too late uh, for Ukraine. Um, uh, and uh, Georgia, in many ways, is lucky uh to have managed uh to sort of separate itself from this uh from this conflict uh and managed to sort of balance more or less between you know between washington uh and and moscow even though georgia's friends uh in in, in the united states are, are are very pissed that georgia has how that it dared to express a sense of pragmatism towards Moscow and refused really to antagonize Russia. Um, but uh, as, as for Ukraine, uh, I hate to say it, but uh, it, it's, it's too late. Uh, the, 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 uh, the way this conflict is going to end um, uh, really at this point depends on Russia, uh, uh, not as much on, on the United States. Uh, and Putin is just not interested uh, in sitting down because they just have not given him anything yeah. uh, substantial uh, that could make any sense for him to sit down and negotiate. And, um, you know, uh, it's just a war of attrition at this point. Uh, the Eastern Ukraine uh, has been shaved off. Uh, Russia will not, in terms of, you know, people say, well, what if you, well, if Russia ever returned it, it will be a capitulation of Russia and Russia will lose, it will be suicidal. So that will never happen. Uh, mark my words, it's just not, you know, the Eastern Eastern Ukraine now will be incorporated under Russia. Um, and uh, the rest of the country is basically uh, uh, going to become, to repeat, Mirosheimers was like a rump state, uh, you know, and Russia, I think, will continue to destruct the country uh, and effectively prevent it from joining NATO. Uh, and so strategically, I think Russia already achieved its goal uh, of, eliminating this possibility never say never obviously but dramatically reducing the chance of ukraine ever becoming nato uh i, I don't see it happening um and this is this is all and, and, and this is this happened when all of this could have been avoided uh so i yeah. think i hate to end this on, the, on, a, on a pessimistic note like this but i think it's too late for ukraine in terms of putting the humpty dumpty back together <laughs> well well that's well well said but which, you know which, which, which makes Georgia's pragmatism even more even more important, right? Yeah. It's such so so crucial for Georgia. So. But, but you know, in that sense, one thing is we Europeans, we Eurasians, right? From 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 China, 
from Vladivostok uh, and 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 and, pa- and Beijing all the way to Portugal and Porto, and and down to Singapore. We need we somehow mm-hmm. need to live together, right? And we cannot escape. So maybe maybe what we can learn is that what's going to come next? There will be a Ukraine. I mean, I cannot imagine that that Russia will try to incorporate these twenty four million uh, Galicians who hate them, who hate their guts to their to the core that's now. Right. Yeah. That, so we will right. have a, a something that's left, right? And then how mm-hmm. that Ukraine that's left then manages its relations. And I'm talking about the next 30 to 50 to 60 years, right? Um, and whether Russia will actually then also try to still find a balance and whether the, the West will say like, okay, fine, we need to pacify this and a generation, we need to give it a generation and 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 keep some sort of relationship, but there will be something and, and hope that that can be based upon a, a Georgian model. I don't know, but there needs to be a tomorrow, right? Correct, correct. There needs to be tomorrow. Um, I believe in it. And uh, just, just last point I want to make: there is nothing more than I would want for Ukraine and Georgia to join NATO, Moldova to join NATO. Really? Uh, this has been the dream of Georgians ever since for the past five hundred to thousand years. Uh, this is all we wanted. NATO uh, or Europe? Part, part of part of the West, part of Europe. Uh, and then the past story is, of course, NATO is part of that big vision. Um, But uh, the fact of the matter is, uh, I think in this case, uh, the harsh world of geopolitics, national interests, trump these idealist, uh, you know, aspirations. Uh, And I don't I don't suggest that Georgia should deviate from this strategic vision. Uh, You know, I I think they should continue um, with this strategic stance of one day becoming uh, members of, uh, you know, the civilized uh, West. But um, you know, that should not come at a separate price of sacrifice in your own statehood. And I think that will take smart politics, um, you know, uh, real politic, international in re- international relations, because let's be honest, liberal internationalism produced very little, if anything, in terms of uh, in terms of maintenance and uh, provision of Georgia's uh, 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 you know, security. Uh, so uh, the other option is to become as pragmatic uh, as and as understanding of your surroundings in the region as possible. Otherwise, as a small state, you're going to get swallowed up. Uh, in, and, and I hope Ukrainians someday will understand that. Um, yeah, because okay, this, this is very this, this is because if you don't have a state, there will be no NATO, there will be no European Union. And this is extremely dangerous. Uh, and Russia has repeatedly shown it. What more do Westerners, Western politics? politicians want like we have facts historic facts suggesting that Russia will do this again um but um you know this this these false narratives are just no 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 for small states the biggest danger at the moment is to believe stupid ideology and we are we are giving a plea for ruthless pragmatism, especially for small states, because we know that Russia and the United States, they do it already anyhow. They sell us this right. stupid narrative in order for us to be yes. willing to throw ourselves into the battle, right? And be slaughtered. So people get away from ideology, go back to ruthless pragmatism, because that's what the other ones are doing too. That's it. And you've got you've done some great work on neutrality. Uh so <laughs> do you have a couple of couple of words to say about that? Or uh do you wanna oh. Well, I, I, mean, I see I see neutrality as this stepchild of uh, international relations that used to be yeah. very important in the 19th century to balance the system when everybody agreed we are living in real politic and we need some form of of, of balancing and, and, and buffer states and so on. And when war was looked at as a tragedy, but fine, you know, more, more like a cancer, you know, more like a, 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 an illness. And, and putting like little neutral spaces there is a way of an antidote to make sure that that these that these cancers don't grow too much. And we are we're headed back toward that direction. So that's why I'm saying um, we should look again at these at these mechanisms of making a realist world work and and get away from this idea that we can do world peace through the United Nations, because look at it, 70 years. And it's a wonderful idea. It's a wonderful idea. And it didn't work. So yes. we need to get we need to we need to no. work on a system that is more bottom up and less top down. And in the bottom up uh, approach, neutrality is a peace making um, strategy, uh, a, a pragmatic, realist one. And so don't look at the Swiss because the Swiss has have the most boring and uh, version of neutrality. Look at the more at the more uh, strategic ones like Mongolia, 
uh, you know, the ones that actually need to use it in order to keep their statehood. And in this sense, I would also say Georgia is now playing much more of a neutral game than, than let's say, the Swiss, because the Swiss have swallowed that that poisonous pill of ideology, unfortunately. <laughs> it, either way, it, it gets caught, caught up into it. I mean, it is within within deep Europe. So, uh, yeah. yeah. But yeah. India, India, I think, in my, my opinion, uh, is a good, India. good case study. Yeah, yeah. Very good but, case. Uh, the whole Donna Line movement and so on. So we need to look at these and and figure out and and also a work on a on a strategy to make to make it attainable. Because because the cool thing is with neutrality, we still have the law of neutrality that hasn't been updated for like hundred years, but it's still there, still valid. We could just go back and dust it off. The book. Refresh it. Yeah. Refresh it, update but, it. But don't forget, history is over, so you can <laughs> go back to <laughs> Oh, Francis Fukuyama, did you have to write that thing? History anyway. is over. Uh, Lasha, this was a very, very uh, enjoyable talk. Thank you very much for taking the time today. Pascal, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me.